Let the Bible Speak Part 1 Being totally convinced that this book, Let the Bible Speak, contains good information about the Bible and the Holy Quran, the Dharma Islamic Dawah and Guidance Center decided to reprint it again. But as we prepare to do the job we have noticed that the copy that was available was too blurred and not good enough for reproduction. Due to this problem, Dhamma Dawa and Guidance Center work it out to review, retyped, annotates and corrects the whole book, such as 1. Some references are missing. 2. Some quotation. 3. Misspelling. 4. Typing errors. 5. Some chapters and verses are not accurate. We have tried our utmost to reproduce the book as it is with some minute changes to ensure that the book will not lose its internal beauty for the benefit of all who read it. To the author, Ali Mishin, we pray that the Almighty Allah continuously showers His mercy and grace to him and add the virtue of this book to his scale of good deeds. We ask Allah's pardon for any mistakes that we commit unknowingly, as it has been for us in preparing it. Preface The writing and publication of this essay is not intended to be an exercise in polemics. Rather is it motivated by the desire to enlighten both Christians and Muslims who in many parts of the world have to live together as fellow countrymen and neighbors. Their enlightenment regarding the original fundamentals of each other's faith would, it is hoped, make them appreciate the basic unity that binds them as adherents of the same original faith. The universal religion which teaches submission to the will of the one true God is the basis on which man's moral behavior is founded. It is unfortunate that Jesus Christ has left for us nothing as authoritative as the Prophet Muhammad has done. In the Aran are the teaching of Islam and their unsullied purity. We do not find the same in the Gospels, Injil. The latter may be compared to the traditions of the Prophet, the Hadith or Sunnah. Of the sayings and the actions of Jesus as reported in the Bible there are admittedly many which are spurious, false, just as they were established and the weak and false were weeded out. It is undeniable that attempts were made, for sectarian and other divisive reasons, to fake sayings and attribute them to the Prophet. Impartial criticism would have to admit, however, that there was much more scientific methodology when the Prophet's traditions came to be collected and shifted than there has been at the adoption of the canonical Gospels. The great scholars, Imams, who devoted their lives collecting the traditions of the Prophet made their best endeavors, Tahad, using strictly scientific standards to verify the genuine traditions. But even their best endeavors and their scientific methods were after all human and not infallible. Fortunately there's the Arun whose authenticity has never been questioned by friend or foe. That is the unshakable foundation of Islam on which the tenets of the faith are based. It is the final criterion of the genuineness of any tradition, and the rock on which the structure of Islam has been built. In the following pages it will be seen that I have tended to reproduce many quotations. This is my way of dealing with the subject seriously, particularly a subject of such transcendent importance as religion. I do not want to be among those who would argue about God without knowledge, and without guidance and without an enlightening book, as the Aran puts it. Studying the Bible in the long solitude of my prison cell I attempted to search for the true teachings of Jesus and the Hebrew prophets who had preceded him. Ten years and five months of imprisonment became ten years and five months of intensive Bible study. Painstakingly I kept removing bit by bit the hard incrustation which had piled up on what I knew. Must be a lustrous lying beneath. I found it. I would appeal to both my Muslim brothers and sisters who know very little of Christianity. And to my Christian friends who know next to nothing about true Islam and true Christianity for that matter to come along with me and in the following pages search for the truth. We will find it. For the truth is the house that has been founded upon the rock, and rain shall fall, and the winds shall blow, but the house shall not fall. There in holy Jerusalem, whence both Muhammad and Jesus rose in spiritual ecstasy to the heavenly presence is a symbol of glaring significance. Denoting the truth that bids both Muslim and Christian bow to the same God who is worshipped with equal fervor and devotion in the mosque upon the rock and in the church of the holy sepulcher. That truth bids us rid ourselves of the traditions of men and follow the commandments of God. That truth bids us relinquish the tendency to divide religion into sex and appoint the unity that binds us together. Allah says in the Holy Quran, And we verily gave Moses the scripture, that haply they might go right. And we made the son of Mary and his mother a portent, and we gave them a refuge on a height, a place of flocks and water springs. O ye messengers! Eat of the good things, and do right. Lo! I am aware of what ye do. And lo! This your religion is one religion and I am your Lord, so keep your duty unto me. But they, mankind, have broken their religion among them into sects, each sect rejoicing in its tenets. So leave them in their error till the time. Quran 
the professional priesthood which has taken upon itself the task of formulating doctrines and rituals as well as rendering certain religious services in accordance with what are believed to be the teachings of Jesus Christ. The church may also mean the sect to which an individual Christian belongs. All the main Christian churches, or sects, teach the following as the principal dogmas, or articles of faith to be believed in without question. 1. There is one God. 2. In God there are three divine persons, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. These three persons are called the Blessed Trinity. They are equal and they are eternal that is they have no beginning and no end. They are not three gods, but one God. 3. The Father is God and the first person of the Blessed Trinity. 4. The Son is God and the second person of the Trinity. He is Jesus Christ who is God who took the human form. He was born of the Virgin Mary about 2000 years ago in Palestine, was crucified, died and rose again from the dead. His death and suffering on the cross was intended to be a sacrifice for the forgiveness of the sins of men. This is called the Atonement, and He is entitled the Savior and the Redeemer. 5. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Blessed Trinity. After the death of Christ the Holy Spirit descended upon the Apostles, our early missionaries, of Christ, and the Spirit continues to lead the Church. 6. Every human child bears with him the sting of what is called the original sin inherited from the transgression of Adam. 7. Baptism, the ceremony of sprinkling somebody with water, or, according to some sects, immersing him in water, as making his being accepted as a member of the Church. And belief in Christ's atonement is the only means whereby man shall be saved. Let us examine the sacred doctrines of the Church in the light of the writings of the Bible which the Church accepts a canonical, that is to say, as the authoritative word of God. The Bible. The word Bible comes from the Greek Biblia meaning books. It is a collection of many books which form the foundation of Christian belief. Admittedly they have been written by a large number of authors, known and unknown. But those authors are believed to have been inspired by God and they wrote the books under the supervision and guidance of God, hence the Bible is referred to as the Word of God. The Catholic Bible, however, is somewhat different from the Protestant Bible. The former consists of 73 books, while the latter has only 66 books. In general the Bible is divided into two main portions, the Old Testament which was written before the advent of Jesus Christ, and the New Testament which was written after Jesus Christ and describes the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and the activities of his disciples, or apostles, in spreading the Christian faith. The New Testament contains also letters addressed to various Christians groups and individuals. These letters were written mostly by Paul, a Jew who converted to Christianity and became the chief exponents of the Christian faith as it known today. He has at times described the true founder of modern Christianity. The books of the Old Testament in their present form were probably written after the return of the Jews from the Babylonian captivity I. After 536 BC those of the New Testament were collected and accepted as legal in the 4th century after Christ, about 367 AD. Besides the four Gospels, describing the life and teaching of Christ, which are in the Bible there are a number of other Gospels which were not accepted by the Church elders, and some of them are available even today. The books which could have formed part of the Bible, and indeed were and are accepted by some Christians, but which the main body of the Christian Church rejected, are called the Apocrypha, a Greek word meaning hidden, but which now has wrongly been understood as meaning false, not genuine. The officially accepted books are called canonical. It is these canonical books of the Bible which are regarded as the Word of God. Original Sin In the Old Testament the first book, Genesis, has the story of creation and the fail of man. Thus is described the fall of Adam from grace. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Genesis 2:15-16. Adam, however, persuaded by his wife, Eve, transgressed God's command and ate of the forbidden tree of knowledge. God cursed them both. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbearing, in pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall cat the plants of Hefield. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Genesis 3:16-19. On account of their sin, the church teaches, Adam and Eve lost sanctifying grace, the right of heaven and their special gifts, they became subject to death, to suffering and to a strong inclination to evil, and they were driven from the garden of paradise. On account of Adam's sin all human beings are born deprived of sanctifying grace and inherit his punishment. This is what is called the original sin.
St. Paul's theology developed the doctrine of original sin to justify another doctrine, redemption by the death of Jesus on the cross. In his letter to the Romans he wrote, Therefore as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all men sinned, sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift and the grace of that one man Jesus Christ abounded for many. Romans 5:12-15. To the Corinthians St. Paul wrote, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15:22. The Pauline doctrine of original sin is, however, contradicted by other passages from the Bible. In Deuteronomy, for example, which is one of the five books of Torah, Moses says, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, nor shall the children be put to death for the fathers, every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Deuteronomy 24:16. In Jeremiah we read, In those days they shall no longer say, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children as teeth are set on edge. But every one shall die for his own sin, each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Jeremiah 31, 29-30 And in Ezekiel it is more categorically stated. Yet you say, why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? When the son has done what is lawful and right, and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Ezekiel 18 19-20 in the New Testament 2 there's the evidence of Jesus himself contradicting the theory of inherited sin. As he passed by, he, Jesus, saw a man blind from his birth, and his disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not this man's sin, or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him, John 9, 1-3. Contrary to the teachings of the church, which goes under his name, that all children are born in sin, Jesus Christ confirms their innocence in the following passage from the Gospel according to Matthew. Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18, 3. Thus we see that the doctrine of inherited sin propounded by Paul is in his first letter to the Corinthians, quoted above, is contradicted by God and Moses in more authoritative evidence from the Bible, namely in Deuteronomy, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, all of the Old Testament, as well as by Jesus Christ in the Gospels according to John and Matthew in the New Testament. The Church however is inclined to disregard the categorical evidence of the Torah, the Prophets and the Gospels, which form the main parts of the Bible, and rely on the letters of St. Paul which for no earthly reason were appended to and then incorporated in the Bible. But who is this Paul? St. Paul. St. Paul was a Jew whom was born in Tarsus in what is now Turkey. When he was born the country was part of Roman Empire, and thus although by race and religion a Jew, he yet enjoyed the privilege of being a Roman citizen. St. Paul was not one of the disciples chosen by Jesus in his lifetime. Indeed there is no indication that he ever met Jesus. What is known is that he was fanatical in hatred for Christians, and engaged himself in hounding out Christians from hiding and bringing them to be tortured and killed. He was present at the stoning of St. Stephen, the first Christian martyr. While on his way to Damascus he is reported to have experienced a vision of Christ, and thus became a staunch propagator of Christianity which he claimed had been revealed to him by Jesus in visions. This, revealed, version of Christianity was fundamentally different from what the chosen disciples of Jesus knew to be the teaching of the Master. So that there was a serious conflict between Paul and the original followers of Christ who like Jesus had never deviated from the Law of Moses and the strict Judaic monotheism. The only Son of God. In the four Gospels of the Bible there are a number of references to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. The following are a few examples. And when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that he thus breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Mark 15 39. And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Luke 1 35. And they all said, Are you the Son of God, then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Luke 22, 70. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now, if he desires, for he said, I am the Son of God. Matthew 27, 43. And whenever the unclean spirits beheld him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered him not to make him known. Mark 3 11-12 And when he came to the other side, to the country of Gadarenes, two demoniac met him, coming out of the tombs, fifty fears that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? 
Have you come here to torment us before the time? Matthew 8 28 29. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there are about 22 such references to Jesus as the Son of God, but in all of them, not once did he call himself so. Matthew 27, 43 quoted above refers to the allegation of the chief priest with the scribes and the elders who mocked him. It was not first hand reporting of Jesus' own statement by the author of the Gospel. It was normally either madmen, the so called demoniac and unclean spirits, or pagan Roman soldiers who referred to him as the Son of God. His own preference was for the title of Ben Adam, which just meant man or son of man. That title is repeated about 80 times in the Gospels. His Jewish persecutors out of malice alleged that he claimed to be king of the Jews that he might incur the wrath of the Roman rulers. And that he claimed to be the son of God to enrage the Jewish people. Francis Young, lecturer in the New Testament studies at Birmingham University, writing in The Myth of God Incarnate says, Apart from John where interpretive material is clearly placed upon the lips of Jesus, the Gospels invariably portray not Jesus but others as using phrases like the Holy One of God, or Son of David, or Son of God. Alone of all the tiles Son of Man regularly appears as used by Jesus himself. It should be remembered that at the time of Jesus it was commonplace to invest with divinity not only non-existent mythological figures but historian mortals as well. Lurdus, the pagan author of the Lives of the Philosophers, writes of a number of philosophers as being sons of God. Plato was described as being of divine parentage, and so was Pythagoras, who was supposed to be the incarnate son of the god Hermes. Empedocles was also alleged to be an immortal god who healed the sick, and his followers worshipped him and prayed to him. Plutarch regards it as beyond that Alexander the Great was of divine descent and Romulus the legendary ancestor of the Romans was the son of Mars, the god of war. He was supposed to have been raised to heaven in a cloud. An inscription of 48b.c. refers to Julius Caesar as God manifest offspring of Ares and Aphrodite and common savior of human life. Another inscription referring to Augustus Caesar says, The Emperor Caesar, son of God, God Augustus, overseer of land and sea. These titles of God, son of God, And, Lord, being common and widespread in the Mediterranean region about the time of Jesus could not but influence the general public who were not deeply infused with the Judaic monotheism. They were terms loosely used by all and sundry. The myths around those other personalities, mythological and historical, were strikingly similar to those later adopted by Christians in the case of the prophet Jesus, on whom be peace. Francis Young in his essay, Two Roots or a Tangled Mass? writes it Aurelia. Moreover, one cannot dismiss out of hand the view that something of the same kind happened in the case of Jesus. There are, to take but one example, general similarities between Livy's account of Romulus and some synoptic narratives about Jesus. A virgin birth, conception by a god, a remarkable career, no trace of his remains after death, an appearance after death to commission his successors, the offering of prayers to him. It would be impossible to make a convincing case for direct influence but people living at roughly the same time do seem to have produced mythological accounts with parallel motifs. To return to the text of the Bible, when Jesus was brought before the court he refused to concur to the charge that he claimed to be the Son of God as madmen and pagans had been propagating about him. And the high priest stalked up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus was silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you hereafter you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Matthew 26, 62-64 The three Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke, called synoptic, meaning common view because they agree in form and content, do not refer to Jesus as the only Son of God. It is the Gospel of John which lays special stress on the divinity of Jesus, and calls him, the only Son of God. And the Word became flesh and dwell among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. John 1 14. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3 16. What is special about the use of the term Son of God? Going through the Bible we find such terms being used in reference to many others besides Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, all of it having been written before the birth of Jesus we find the following examples. When men began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair, and they took wives such of them as they chose. Genesis 6, 1-2. On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Job 38, 6-7.
Yet the number of the people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can be neither measured nor numbered, and in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. It shall be said to them sons of the living God. Hosea 1.10 Apparently it was weak common practice before the time of Jesus even for Hebrew writers on religious subjects to use the term sons of God in reference to those who were beloved of God. An Italian biblical authority, Marcello Craveri, who wrote The Life After Jesus, however, believes that the term has in history undergone changes through mistranslation. He writes, Actually, the Old Testament does contain the phrase Bed Yahweh, which, however, means the servant of God, the slave of God, God's liege subject. The Greek text of Septuagint translates it equivocally as Pais Theo, inasmuch as Pais, like the Latin, pure, can mean either little boy or slave, subsequently. It was quite simple to replace Pais in the sense of boy with Kios, which means son. Indeed in Hebrew literature even the term God seems to have been rather loosely used. In Exodus we read of God addressing Moses and telling him about the relation which would be between him and Aaron. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. Exodus 4.16 Note again. I say, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you nevertheless, you skull die like men and fall like any prince. Psalm 82, 6-7 All those quotations are from the Old Testament. Let us now see what the New Testament has to say. Luke reports Jesus preaching. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the selfish. Luke 6:35. In the Gospel according to Matthew Jesus is reported to say, Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Matthew 5, 9. Paul in his letter to the Romans writes, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Romans 8, 14. The two men who are said to have done their utmost to ascribe divinity to Jesus Christ are John and Paul. And yet from the above quotation Paul definitely admits that Jesus was not the only son of God, but all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Let us see what John has to say, he who has coined the phrase, the only son of God. In the course of an argument Jesus had with the Jews who wanted to stone him, he asked of them for which of the good works that he had shown them were they stoning him? The Jews answered him, we stone you for no good works but for blasphemy. Because you being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered him, is it not written in your law, I said. You are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him of whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world? You are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? John 10 36 In other words Jesus was pointing out to his Jewish persecutors that the term Son of God was no more blasphemous than the term gods which had been used in respect of others previous to him. At least that is what the writer of John's Gospel implies. Jesus' own personal preference was for the term son of man, in Hebrew, Arabic and Swahili, Ben Adam, which just means man. This is repeated no less than 80 times in the New Testament, mostly spoken by Jesus himself. Not once is he reported to categorically call himself the son of God in any special sense. Finally let us consider Christ's last words when he was about to ascend to heaven as related in the Gospel of John. I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. John 20:17. It is very clear to understand what Jesus meant by this single sentence, that his sonship was in no way different from the sonship of all men. The American writer, Upton Sinclair, says in his book, A Personal Jesus, and lest anyone think that. In calling God his Father he was proclaiming himself the Son, let it be made clear that he called God your Father, too. He said it eighteen times in the New Testament, your Heavenly Father Noeth, and so on. He meant that we were all sons of God, and he was one of them. God and Jesus, are they one and the same? Christian churches teach that Jesus Christ is not only the Son of God, but that He is very God. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are one. Three in one, and one in three, they are co-eternal and co-equal. Jesus is God, and God is Jesus. That is the Christian dogma, to which the majority of those who call themselves Christians subscribe. Saint Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians wrote, We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. 1 Corinthians 15:15. 15, 15. In spite of Paul's alleged belief that Christ was the same being as God, he could not but say, God raised Christ. Dash if Jesus and God were one and the same, would it not have been more appropriate to speak of the operation in the following terms? Christ raised himself. If God raised Christ, the two could not possibly be the same being. One was definitely the performer, and the other upon whom the operation was performed. John, the other strong advocate of the divinity of Christ, reports in his gospel that Jesus said, "Let not your hearts be troubled." Believe in God, believe also in me. 
the word also emphasized the distinction between God and Christ. In the Acts of the Apostles we read, And he, Stephen, said, Be holy, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Acts 7.56 The Son of Man, as Jesus preferred to call himself, is seen by Stephen to be standing at the right hand of God. Hence he cannot at the same time be God. And this is a description of a situation in heaven, he is no longer the Jesus of this world described in Hebrew 2 as having been made like his brethren in every respect. So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. On the Mount of Olives to which Jesus fled hunted by the Jews, he took occasion to withdraw from his disciples, and there in seclusion prayed to God. Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. Luke 22 42-43 We note here three important things. 1. Jesus prays to God, Jesus worship God. Hence they are two separate beings of unequal status to the extent that one has to pray to the other. 2. They have two separate wills, but the will of Jesus, the Son of Man, is subordinate to that of God. God's will must prevail. 3. Jesus, being a man, loses heart and weakens, and God Almighty, as the source of all strength, sends an angel to strengthen Jesus. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says categorically, For the Father is greater than I, John 14 28. And finally on the cross, and about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. It is clear from the above quotation that Jesus and God are not only separate entities, but their will are different and could be even contradictory. The superior will must however prevail. What is shocking, however, is the despairing tone of Christ's supplication on the cross. Far from being the only begotten Son of God or God, we could not expect such weakness even from an ordinary mortal with a trust in God. 